All right, today's AutoCAD Tips and Tricks with me. I'm the presenter. I'm one of our senior support specialists here, and our host is Lori. So Tips and Tricks 2022, this is our first one. This is our first Tips and Tricks of actual Tips and Tricks of the year. We've had some other things. So first things first, a little bit about who I am. Those of you who have not been here before don't know who I am. My name's Ryan Wunderlich. I have about 36 years of experience in AutoCAD across multiple industry segments. And speaking of which, we're gonna launch a real quick poll here. And we wanna find out how many years of AutoCAD experience you guys have. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch that poll. Poll is open. If you just go ahead and answer that question, that'll, that'll help me out. Um, I'm currently one of our senior support specialists here. So if you, have, if you have AutoCAD issues and you have your contracts with us, you can, you can get into our case queue and you can talk to technical support. And if it's, uh, if chances are you will be talking to me, I do support most of the products. Um, if you call about a vault question, I'm probably not gonna help you, but if you call about anything that's AutoCAD based, even Revit, Navisworks and some of the others, I generally, We'll grab those cases if I can. Um, I have taught as a certified instructor. I do teach here out of the Boise office um, when classes come up. Um, I've had over 15 years of CAD management experience as a as an actual CAD manager in title. I've had eight years in more than eight years in cruise ship building, five years in civil survey landscape architecture. I've worked in mechanical, electromechanical, printed circuit board, and schematic design, architectural design, and acoustic design as well as doing equipment layouts in industrial spaces. And just a little bit about me, I have a bachelor's in business management and a master's in organizational management. Um, since I'm a senior support specialist here, I've spent most of my time under the IT umbrella. So I'm also very IT fluent as well as product fluent. So uh, Thomas, you have no sound on your end. You should have sound. You may need to leave and come back or you may need to check the volume settings on your computer to make sure that you're going through the right device and that the volume's turned up. So with that, let's talk about today's agenda. Um, I'm gonna say we've probably, we're about 90% voted. So we'll leave the poll open just a little bit longer. So today's agenda, we're gonna talk about how to use non-standard text files. Those are SHX fonts, not true type fonts, and your best practices to get them into AutoCAD so that you can use them. We're gonna talk about background masking on mText and why not to use wipeouts or, or text mask, which is in Express Tools. And then we're gonna probably come to the big one that everyone's here actually wanting to see is how to create custom hatch patterns. So I'm gonna give you some basics on it. And really it's a walkthrough so that you understand how a hatch pattern is actually created. And then hopefully this will give you some guidance on creating your own. And with that, if you're, a, we've had the poll open about two and a half minutes, Lori, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll now. Perfect. Okay. So, wow. We've got some 5% that are zero to one years, 18% that are one to five, and 77% that are five or more. You're old timers like I am. So when I talk about certain things, you all laugh and snicker behind your hand, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. There. Can everyone see today's agenda now? I see it. Yep, excellent. So let's get started with how to use non-standard text files. So these are called SHX. So AutoCAD comes built with several built-in SHX fonts, Simplex, Roman S, Roman D, right? Roman Simplex, Roman Duplex, Roman T, Roman tri Triplex, et cetera. And sometimes we either have ones carried forward from older versions of AutoCAD, or we found them on the web, or you know we want to use certain ones. Uh, hand, handwriting, and many others. Uh, some of these sometimes come from MicroStation. You can get um, SHX from MicroStation. Um, and that gives us some customization of how we want things to look. If you're an architect, every architect I've ever talked to really likes to use hand or handwriting or hand one, just so that it looks like it's a hand-drawn drawing. That's fine. Uh, many of these are holdovers before release 14, not 2014, but release 14 from 97. That was the first version that actually allowed us to use true type fonts in AutoCAD. Prior to that, we had to use SHX. Um, so in order to use these in AutoCAD, we must have them available in the support file search path. Right, so it's pretty easy. And typically I recommend the following, 
So the first thing we want to do is we want to create a directory on the network of the local machine, put in the fonts you need, and add a support path and AutoCAD options to point there. Okay, that's the easiest way to do that. A couple of things to be very aware of. The more fonts you put in there, the slower the mText editor can become when editing or creating mText. Okay, I can't stress that enough. And the other thing is only put in what you really need. Don't put everything and the kitchen sink in there, right? Because you really only want to be using just those font files that you actually use in practice or in your standards from your drawing. So the first thing we do is we create a directory for me. Mine's under working data, RAW is my initials, Ryan A. Wunderlich and fonts. And then I have a fonts directory here. We add the support path here. So we go into our AutoCAD options under the files tab and we put in support file search path and we put in our working data raw fonts. And now once we've added that, we have to close and reopen AutoCAD to reinitialize those support paths. So now we can see those fonts in there. Right? This is one of the big things is that the order in the support file search path does in fact matter. So in AutoCAD and any of the AutoCAD based software, it processes from the top down order. So that I, re I generally recommend custom items typically should be near the bottom or below the standard items unless you are wanting to have it read your information before it reads the standard information from the actual out of the box AutoCAD. If your font folder is before the default fonts, any duplicates are ignored from the installed AutoCAD. That's very important to understand is that because it sorts in top down, as soon as it finds Roman S.SHX, whatever place it finds it, that's what it's going to load from and it will ignore all other instances. So if you've modified one of your SHX fonts, you need to make sure that it's above the built in fonts. And then I recommend that only your custom ones live in that folder and that you remove duplicated ones that are installed with AutoCAD because now you're just perpetrating additional work, additional operations while AutoCAD has to go through and search through these directories for things. The big one here, true type fonts or TTFs must be installed on Windows. You right mouse click and select install, place them in your custom fonts folder will not let them be read by AutoCAD. Yeah, I can't stress this enough. I run into this with a lot of people where they're like, well, I have all my fonts in this custom directory and there's true type fonts in there. And they're like, I can't see the true type fonts. And I'm like, well, you actually have to install those to Windows. Right, so we'll just do a quick demonstration here. So since I happen to have AutoCAD up, right? First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my options. In my support file search path, you'll see right down here, I have my working data webinar fonts folder. This is where I actually stuck them for today. And if we go ahead and look at what's in that fonts folder, you'll see that I have some hand lettering. Now, mind you, I have accumulated a large number of fonts over the years. These are, this is 534 and there's more. I actually have this listing, which is 1,305 SHX fonts that I've accumulated over years. Okay, if I don't have it, chances are, I'm not sure where to find it, but I have, I have these because I've run into way too many issues where I keep getting that SHX not found and it replaces it with simplex, things like that. So I have these in here as my backup. All right, once we've added our working folder here, or we've added our fonts folder, and we can put this anywhere. If I want to, I can actually move this up above my AutoCAD fonts here, so it would read my custom fonts before AutoCAD. Again, it really shouldn't matter as long as you're not duplicating which files are which, and then it's gonna read this one first, because again, it reads top down, so it'll read this directory first. And believe it or not, in this directory, you will find a simplex.shx. That is where the simplex one actually lives, is in this support directory, and that's why that's your default if you can't find something. And then it goes through, it will read these fonts, and then finally it will read my fonts at the very end. And we're gonna discard changes because I didn't make any. So when we come over here to the text, and you'll see I have hand, I have some hand lettering here. And you'll see these are all of those SHX fonts right here because of that folder. 
Now, the other thing is when we're talking about true type fonts, and we'll talk about those real quick here. So when I go to our webinar and I talk about true type fonts, so these are all TTFs, they'll say true type font. And in order to install these, you have to right mouse click and you have to say install. That will make it available not only in AutoCAD, but in any Windows-based program. Uh, these particular fonts that I have here, um, if you um, if you have ever traveled internationally and you've seen the TUI, TUI um, travel group, um, they own hotels, planes, um, cruise ships, things like that. They have their own specialized font. And so that's how I would install these. Right mouse click, hit install, install each one of these, and then they would and then after I close and reopen up AutoCAD, they would be available for me to use. Uh, Ann Ullman, will you please talk about Adobe Acrobat and SHX fonts showing as pop-up boxes in Adobe PDF files? Yes, absolutely I will. So if I send anything that has an SHX font here into a PDF, it will come up and show the PDF and then there'll be, a, or it will show up in the PDF here and then there will be a little note. And you've got one of two things, either you accept the note will be there or you have to set your SHX PDF to zero and then it will no longer give that as a note and it will actually convert your SHX to geometry. So it won't be selectable text in the PDF. I think that's what you're getting to, Anne. Uh, Philip Martinson, where can a person find fonts to download? You have a Google search engine that is massive that can help you find a lot of those things, Philip. Um, one of my great resources is a lot of the cities, counties, and states will have their standards where they will have a lot of those SHXs. Or you can talk to people, um, see who might have some, things like that. All right. Any other questions about those? All right. Now we're going to talk about background masking. So M text, anything that uses M text. Once a font, oh sorry, Anthony. Once a font loads, it occur, if it occurs later in the support folder, will it reload a custom one? Um, once a font is loaded, if it occurs in the support order, will it reload a custom one? If your custom one is a different name than an out-of-the-box one, yes. If it is the same name as an out-of-the-box one and you've made modifications, you need to make your fonts directory above the AutoCAD built-in font so it will read yours first. Sometimes import PDF from insert command won't recognize the SHX text. Yes, it will not recognize the SHX. There is an option in AutoCAD to recognize SHX fonts when you bring in the PDF. And I'll remember what that is in just a minute, uh, Viral. Uh, mentioned that the true type font have a fixed ink area unlike SHX vector fonts. Yes. So when I am talking about SHX, or this is a true type, this is a true type, these are just Arial. These will actually fill in just like this. This will print here unless it's a specific color, and then we can adjust the line weight or the style. So either CTB or STB to make this appear thicker. Uh, any idea if Autodesk is going to make SHX usable in other applications in the Autodesk family, i.e. Revit? Nope, it will not. Um, and that's just because SHX is really an ancient technology. Um, that's the best way to describe it. Are there any settings or properties that make dealing with right to left languages easier? That is going to be, and that's a very good question. In here, if you go, it's not backwards. I know what you're talking about. There is a reading order in M text where you can set it to read right to left or left to right. Uh, but that's only available in M text. So I hope that 
Uh, will limiting number of fonts significantly affect speed? Yes, I can tell you that right now. If I load up that directory that I had here with my fonts here that has this 1305, if I double click on an M text to edit it, um, it will take some time to process. It's it's going to add an extra two, three, four, five, sometimes as many as 10 or 15 seconds to bring up your M text editor in order to read through, parse through, make sure it loads all these fonts and moves on. Um, we were told to avoid all SHX files if we were going to be interfacing our civil 3D files with Revit since Revit only accepts true type text. Is that correct? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Um, SHX fonts have other issues inside Civil 3D as well, and it relates to styles, and it depends on how your template was started. And I actually have a blog on that specific item in our in our resources. Um, and Roger, I will come back to you and try and find that link for you. Can we create SHX text for a project specific? And if yes, how do you do it? That is not something I can cover today. You actually need a special program to compile and create your own SHX fonts. That's gonna be the easiest answer I can give you for that. And that is a task unto itself. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that you understood that. Um, let's see, let's go back to here. So now we're gonna go on to background mask. Um, so M text. So dimensions and multi-leaders are included in that because those use mtext, plus fields, because fields are in mtext, and attributes can have a mask, background mask applied. Right, background masking is like the Express Tools text, max, text mask or wipeout. And how many of you like to use text mask or wipeouts? Um, and those of you that are that do that, that's fine, just understand the more of those that you add, where you do a lot of text masking via the command text mask and wipeouts will cause performance issues because what it's essentially doing when you do a text mask or a wipeout is creating a blank Olay object with the background color and it's attaching it to your drawing. So it's essentially embedding an image. So the more of those you have, you will start seeing performance issues, panning and zooming and things like that. Right, we can turn on the background mask automatically in dimension styles, but we must manually add it to other elements. David Edwards, can you permanently modify the background test max defaults? No, you cannot. That has been on the wish list item now for about eight years and they have not given it to us. Um, we can turn on background masking automatically in dimension styles, but we must manually add it to the other elements. And unlike text, text mask or wipe out, the background mask is tied to the text object, so they will dynamically adapt to new shapes and sizes. How do we overcome the line work through text without text mask? You can't, you either need to break the line or you need to put masking in in order to wipe out the line underneath. So, right, background masking on M text. Here's how we add a background mask to an M text based element. We open the M text in the M text editor. We select the text. Control A works really well here to select it all. We right mouse click and we select background mask from our list and we set our parameters. First thing you have to do is you have to check the use background mask. You'll have a border offset factor. Typically, this starts at either one and a half or zero, depending on which version of AutoCAD you are running. Typically, I like 1.3, and this offset factor is basically how much, um, if you assume that if you want it to go to the exact extents of the text, it's one. If you want it a little bigger, it needs to be bigger than one. If you want it smaller, it needs to be smaller than one. And then you have two options here. You have a fill color. I can either use the drawing background color, which means it'll essentially be blank, or I can specify a specific color. So in cases where maybe my CTB style is plotting um, 255 as a blank wipeout, which is what I use typically for hatches, that I need to mask parts and things like that as 255, 
and I can either set it to use my background drawing color or I can set it to color 255 in that drop down here and then it will always print as blank. Is there a place to set the border offset factor for dim text? There is not and it is assumed that if I remember correctly it's one point I think that's 1.5 around dimensions and I have not found a place to figure out where to change that. Uh, border offset factor cannot be less than one. Why is that not the default? Um, again, different different versions of AutoCAD have handled this differently. I know in older versions, it was always 1.5 when you opened it up the first time. Um, in 23, the default is zero. Yep, uh, let's see. I have never had to select the text to create background mask. Can you have only parts of an M text and entity mask? Yes. So basically you select what you want background mask and then you select background mask and it should only mask the, some pl the area that you've selected. Somewhere in the past we imported a drawing that uses a text called C3D English for which I don't have the SHX. This is causing issues when opening the drawing is looking for the file when plotting plots, boxes and symbols. One allow me to purge the style. Is there some way to fake a text file so that I can get rid of this annoying hanger on? Uh, Roger, yes. Um, you can get around that. Um, that is a bigger issue, and I covered that, I want to say, in one of my previous webinars, where you can use the CAD standards checker to force that font that's being used with that SHX style to something that does work. Um, that's one option. The other option is we can we can use the newer purge command to find out where that's being used or referenced, and then we can find that. Um, Let's see, does background text mask have a significant speed impact? No, actually it has no impact whatsoever where text mask or wipeouts do. And can you mask with a pattern instead of a full color? No, only a color. You've got either the drawing background color or regular color. For all other elements, um, you can either edit one at a time, you can use Q select or select similar, and then use your properties box to change the background mask. For dimension styles, can the background mask act be actual white, not black? Yes, you just have to specify the color, and depending on your background color will determine what you have. If you want it to be white, might your best bet there is color 255. That is the closest one to white mark. So for dimension styles right here, um, you open up the dimension style editor, DD style, you select the dimension style to modify, click the modify button, and then you go to the text tab and change the fill color to background, and it will background mask your dimension text. Now we're gonna talk about the actual properties. The border offset is how much beyond the text you want masked, the default is one, I like default of 1.5. I was just in a drawing and found out that in 2023, it's zero um, as the default. But once you've set it in your drawing until you close and reopen AutoCAD, that is the property it does remember. The fill color can be specified. You can use drawing background color. And I've already talked about that in case you have a color that plots blank like 255 in your CTB. And then we're gonna talk real quick about why we don't why I don't use or we shouldn't use wipeouts or text masking unless we have no other option. Both of these were express tools at one point. Now, actually, these were VIP tools, if you guys have, remember way, way, way back. Uh, Tom Stokel, actually, one of the programmers at Autodesk was the one that actually created these. They create a special object. It's actually an image and is similar to inserting an OLE that is a background color. These do cause serious behavior and slowness issues due to graphics handling of these image type objects because it's essentially creating an image. The more you have, the more performance issues will present themselves in zoom, pan, regen, and other graphics intensive operations. I came here for why not to use wipeouts under MTEX. Thank you very much. I use a custom app that places rectangular blocks with either wipeout or faded XY scaled to match text blocks, auto lisp, yep, much faster than AutoCAD's text masking. Henry, that's fine. Just I, I tell people don't use wipeouts or text masks just because 
they do cause problems. Um, I have a Lisp routine that if I suspect wipeouts are in the drawing, I can run it and it's going to actually wipe out all, it, it'll erase all wipeouts. It's a purge wipeout command is what I call it. And it will remove all the wipeouts, um, including text mask in the drawing. And then I can put in what I actually need, or we can, you know, move forward from there. So we'll just do a quick, quick one here. So we're going to come back to here. So again, I have some sample text here. So you'll see I can click on the sample text here and I can turn on background mask from properties here, right? Last thing I did was 1.2 and it's going to remember those settings. And now it's going to wipe that out. If I want, I should be able to come back in here and turn wipe out mask off for this. Now, if I just edit this, I can grab just that line of text. And it will wipe out the whole thing. So uh, it, they used to be able to do that. Um, so apparently that's gone away. So you, it's an all or nothing. Uh, with multi-leaders, again, we can set a background mask on a multi-leader to yes, and it will mask it. Now, mind you, I don't have the ability to change the background mask from the what properties. So I actually have to come in here and go to background mask. And here I can actually change the properties to 1.3 in order to make it smaller. Does draw order affect back, background mask over line work? Yes. So if I grab these and I bring those to the front, that's a very good question. You will see it ignores the wipeout or the background masking. So that does matter. All right, so let me send these to the back again. And then for our dimension style again, we'll just come up here. We'll modify, I'll come over to text. I'll turn my fill color to background. And then my dimension text is now wiped out. And Bill, is there a way to have mText default to use text masking? No, there is not, unfortunately. This is buns. This has been on the Augie wish list. Those of you that are familiar with Augie know that there's a wish list of top 10 items that they submit to Autodesk regularly every year for improvements and things they want to add to the next version. Um, we've been asking for this one for a long time in order to be able to set a default. It would be really nice to come in here set a text style and have a checkbox that says text mask. They haven't added it yet. All right, is there a way to search for and select wipeouts and delete them? You're honestly, your best bet is to go Q select. Gonna come up here to object type, look for the word wipeout or text mask. Come in here and say select all, hit okay, and then erase them. All right, I have a block I created that has a background mask, but bringing a line to the front when editing the block doesn't bring that line in front of the mask after closing the block. Any quick fix? Daniel McKnight, I will tell you, I will tell you right now, because you're using a block definition, you actually have to draw those in order. So what I typically do in this case is that I will put in my hatch or my wipeout using the border that's there. And then I will copy the border and put it on and basically copy it in place. So I'll have two copies of the border. And that way you have the correct elements in the correct order that way, because draw order does not work in blocks. You actually have to draw them in the order you want them to work from, you know, background mask in the back, and then you have to put your line work on top. And attribute definitions have a background mask. Yes, they sure can. Because your attributes, if you do your attributes correctly, they should be mText and you should be able to mask those. Um, let's see, is there a way to convert old text to mText? Yes, it's actually very easy. There is a, uh, it's text to mText and it should be still right here. Convert text to mText, it's an express tool. Um, you click on the express tool, you pick your piece of text, you click enter and it will convert it to M text and then you can do these things to it. All 
right? Oh, wow, we're already up to a half hour. So now let's get into probably what everybody was really interested in seeing here today, was how to create custom hatch patterns. Is there a better way to use a keynote symbol with the text attribute that you want to have a wipeout in? For example, we have hex square diamond circle keynotes, not just the text. So we have the wipeout under the symbol line work. Um, Express tools do not work in LT, they don't exist. Sorry, Stephen. Um, is there a better way to include the entire symbol, not just the attribute? Yes, put a hatch. Um, what I typically do for symbols like that, that I want to do the whole thing is that I'm going to put in a hatch at color 255. In my CTB, I will set color 255 to 0% screening and it will play blank, it will plot as a blank hatch, essentially a blank wipeout area, plus it will help. Is there any advantage to using text versus M text? Yes, uh, single line text, just plain D text is the single line text. You have very little manipulation you can do. M text is a full featured text. In other words, you can add fields, you can stack fractions, you can do a large number of things in M text that you can't actually do with regular D text. Um, is there a way to add attributes to an M civil 3D smart note? No, there is not. All right. So now on to creating custom hatch patterns. It's going to be the basics, but this will give you an idea on how we do a quick walkthrough on creating custom hatch patterns. We're going to start with the basics. So a hatch pattern file, a .pat, we will create, we'll be using just plain AutoCAD and Notepad for our editing. And I'm going to walk step by step through the construction of each step. And when we're done, we'll have a scaled hatch pattern that looks just like this. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at our lines of code. So here's the hatch pattern of code we're gonna create. So we have a star, a my paver, a comma, a description, and then we have this information that talks about how we, how we want the hatch pattern to build the lines. And then we have a blank line at the very end of it. Now, this doesn't mean anything yet. But what's important is that we're gonna to go to here. So as we look at this, we're gonna look at just one line of code. So we understand what we're looking at. So the written code breakdown, the red is the angle. So it defines the angle that the line of the line in the hatch pattern. Yes, um, there will be a PDF um, of this presentation when we're done. Um, you'll reach out to Lori to get a copy of that. I will send that to her. Um, in addition, I will also include the drawing to her that's gonna talk about all of the hatch patterns. And we're gonna go, as I walk through this, so you will have all of the text in here in the presentation and it's also in the drawing. So the first red character here talks about the angle, defines angle lines in the hatch pattern. So it defines, um, screen's not showing full presentation. I'm not sure how to fix that for you. Um, the green pair here, and it's a pair. The first one is the X coordinate of the base point, the Y is origin is the Y coordinate of the base point. Uh, does this hatch pattern definition also work for Revit hatches? That one I'm not sure, but if you create it in AutoCAD, you can import that pattern into Revit. I know you can do that. The blue pair here is the delta Y, so it specifies the offset of successive lines. This applies to dash lines and is measured along the direction of the lines. So it's a delta X and a delta Y. And then the purple pair is a, refers to your dash length and it defines a non-continuous line using the same system as line type definition. So positive for a dash, negative for a space and zero for a dot, okay? So we'll start with the first line. So our first line is my paver, my custom paver. So the first part, the star my paver must be the name of the pat file when it's done. So it would be called my paver dot pat. Um, how can we create XREF file in drawing? That's not gonna get covered today, but we'll, we can talk about that next uh, webinar in December. I'll need a little more information from you. Um, so we have the first part, my paver, it's the name of the pat file then a comma, and then the description. So my description is my custom paper. 
Now we're going to look at this graphically first because I want to make sure you guys understand this from a graphic situation. So the first line we're going to draw, right? And you'll see line two. Because again, our first line is the text, or is the name of the pattern. Line two is the yellow line. So we're drawing the line zero degrees. And we're going to have a start point of zero, zero, which is this point right here. And it doesn't necessarily need to be zero, zero in your drawing. It's just zero, zero is where the hatch is derived from is right here. And then we are going to have a delta X of zero. So it's not going to change the X direction here. And we're going to have a delta Y of 14.75 or 14.875. So it will go 14.875, 14.875 to the top here. And then we're going to draw the line 44.6875 this direction with a zero def with no spaces or anything. So it's just going to be a dot at the end. All right. So that's the yellow lines. So that's line two. Line three is the red line. So we're going to draw a line at 90 degrees. We're going to start at zero, zero. We're going to repeat this every 44.6875. So here, and we're going to draw it 29.75, which is the vertical distance up and end at a dot. All right, so now we've got the yellow and the red lines. And so now we're going to come back and we're going to grab this line. So we're going to draw this line at 40. We're going to see that this line starts at 7.375 and zero. So it's going to start here. We're going to repeat this every 44, every 44.6875. So the next one would be over here somewhere. Uh, origin needs to be zero, zero if you need it to coincide with the hatch origin resets or else you need to know the origin offset. Actually, you don't when creating a hatch pattern. You actually don't, Henry. Um, what we're referring to when we're talking about this zero, zero, what we're referring to is the start point of where the hatch is. The origin is completely irrelevant here. This is only the internal origin to where the hatch is being built. Wanted to clarify that with you. So that line four, we're gonna repeat this every 44 over here. And then we are gonna draw a line that's 14.875. And then we're gonna have a gap of 14.875. So as it repeats up, the next one would be another cyan line up here and another blank space. Line five, we're gonna draw at 90. We're gonna start at 14.875, which is this dimension here. And again, we're gonna repeat this every 44 feet or 44.6875 units, and we're gonna start with a gap first of a negative or a space of 14, and then we're gonna draw a positive 14. Same thing for line six, except we're starting at 22.25. And then our magenta line here is going to start at this 29.8125. And again, we're going to draw the line, and then we're gonna draw a gap. Right, so as we do each one of these, and basically this is what I did. First line angle zero, starts at zero, zero, repeats every 14.875 and is drawn that. The red lines, and again, I have the little graphic down here so we can see exactly what's going on. Cyan line, green line, blue line, this is everything that I've covered. So a space here, a line at that, and then the fill is 20 29.75 vertical because that's what we're trying to fill. Magenta line, and then line eight, we need to have an empty blank line. So we hit a carriage return at the end, right? We go all the way back up here. So we have a blank line at the end in order for it to read this as being a correct hatch pattern file and we'll read it in AutoCAD. So now we test this in AutoCAD. Best place to start is to create a hatch pattern folder. And again, this makes it easier for future upgrades as well, because then it's just a matter of adding C colon backslash working data hatch as my example. We add the, pat add the hatch pattern to the options, just like we did for fonts earlier. And I also have a blog here that specifically talks how to use custom hatch patterns in AutoCAD based programs and AutoCAD LT. Launch the hatch command, and it should be at the bottom of the list, and we check our work and make sure that it does exactly what we want. 
So we launch the hatch command and it should be at the bottom of the list. It should say my paver. And when I create a hatch, this is what it looks like. So now you've got the basics. So now we can experiment and create new ones as needed. So I have a two by four unit brick here that only has a one third offset instead of being halfway offset. That's this set of code right here, piece of cake. Now we can get into a little more complex things. So this one is a four by 12 Chevron. So this dimension here is four. The overall length from here to here is 12 and it will do a Chevron pattern like that. Is this based on a drawing scale of one? Yes, everything I did here is based off of one to one. So I draw this and I create my hatch pattern at true scale. So if, I, if I'm inserting this and it's true brick size or it's a true, in this case, these tiles were exactly these sizes, I would draw this one to one so I don't have to monkey with hatch scaling in order to get it to fit or do what I want. I can just say it's a hatch scaling of one and it will show up exactly true one to one. That's a very good question, Charles. That's how I typically like to do my hatches, simply because it makes it much easier for me later on down the road. Now, where I'm gonna do a visual walkthrough. Again, I'm gonna show you that drawing and we're gonna talk about it again. And then as a point of note, excessive custom hatch patterns will cause delays when launching or editing hatches. So be aware of that and I will demonstrate that. Is there a way to have the hatch center Uh, Steven, I'll, I'll need to, I'm not sure, uh, have the hatch center zero, zero. Um, that would be changing the hatch origin. If the origin is zero, zero, you can make the pattern start at the corner of the boundary using the set origin. Yes, of course, Henry. I'm not talking about how we get the hatch pattern to do what you need it to do as far as if you want this to start at the zero, zero, you need to change the hatch origin. Yes, and I've covered that. What I'm talking about is when we build these, we want these to all assume that this corner is zero, zero as we draw this hatch pattern out. So as we draw this, and you'll see even in the drawing here, let me get my drawing open. I am not at zero, zero here. But when we draw the hatch pattern, this is the assumed zero, zero that all of our line work is going to be going with. Okay. Yeah, never explode hatch patterns. Uh, you can, I don't recommend it. So it is, it is equal to the boundary of the hatch box. Let's see, now I'm, now I'm getting a little back here the origin is zero zero so it is equal to the boundary of the hatch box that you're going to have to figure out on your own your hatch box if you're trying to fit it within the hatch box you're going to have to alter your scale factor in order to make it go fit one to one can you draw curves or arcs in a hatch pattern or just lines it will only do straight lines because it is going from point A to point B. So there is no ability to add an arc or things like that. Now, if you have something special, Express Tools here does actually have something called Super Hatch in it, where you can take a block that has curves in it and you can use Super Hatch in order to use that. Uh, why do you have to move a hatch at least once before the nodes will show up? Corner or midpoint? Uh, Bob, that's going to be entirely dependent on your border and how you're drawing it. Um, if your hatch is associated to the boundary, clicking on the hatch will only show you the center point. And as soon as you move it and bring it back, you've detached it from the boundary. So you actually have to modify the boundary. Uh, let's see. Can you... To do, to do. Would you recommend creating an arabesque hatch? How would I recommend? Well, I'd need to see the actual hatch pattern and then we can we can work on it from there. And can we have line weights on a hatch? No, we cannot have line weights on a hatch because again, it is just drawing simple lines. You have to use your CTB or STB in order to drive a thickness. 
yes, if it's representing a brick, it needs a specific scale. If the boundary must be adjusted to actually be a multiple of your brick dimension. Henry, I don't know what to say. Um, I, I draw these one-to-one -one when I do hatch patterns so that if I'm filling something in, that's what I expect. Um, if your building facade is not big enough to have it correct, you're going to have to split the bricks somewhere. Um, not all architects are really good at at getting a building that's exactly a multiple of the brick width that you're using. Right? And so this is the drawing I'm going to provide you. This is the actual... These are the bricks that I wanted to represent. Here's the hatch pattern laid out. And then here is the text of how I did the paver. And then here is all of my instructions in this drawing. And I will have this drawing available as well for distribution. Um, again, we can reach out to Lori. She will be happy to pass this along. How can we create a new dimension style? Um, all right, so we're not going to talk about that today because that's not what we were going to be talking about, but I can put that on my list of things to possibly put on the December one. So don't panic. We can definitely come back and talk about how we create new dimension styles um, in December since that, since that can be something we can do. So when I'm talking about excessive hatch patterns, let me do that. So I'm going to come back to here and I'm going to go into my options. Actually, I'm going to start a brand new drawing for that. All right, so I'm just going to draw a basic rectangle. Is it there aren't, is it that there there isn't a good font for Arabic that doesn't explode words into individual letters when exported to PDF, or is that an issue with plot settings? I've tried every out-of-the-box font and none export correctly. Um, are you exporting or plotting to PDF is going to be my first question. What are you reading your PDFs with as a second? What are you plotting with using? Uh, can you add creating a custom line type to your December list? I can. I also have a blog on creating a custom line type. Um, let me see if I can find that real quick. Well, let me just move this down over here. All right. Yeah, I have how to create a custom line type right here. Hang on just a second. Now I'll put that in the chat for everyone. There, there's my blog on it, but we can certainly cover it. Now, let's get back to here where I'm at. So if I go into my options, and I actually have another, this is my fonts directory, here's my hatch directory. So these are a lot of the hatches that I have created over time. There's 128 in here. Um, and I simply go and add, and I add that, and I hit OK. Now when I go to Hatch, and this is my HP DLG box, because that's how I have my, and again, I covered this last one, HP DLG mode. I will set that back to two. Now when I Hatch, and what I want you to notice is that when I launch the Hatch command, there is a slight delay well, I come in here and all of those hatches that I've loaded now appear at the bottom. And then this is where the hang up comes while it's trying to read the patterns. Excessive hatch patterns can cause a lot of problems. All right, so here's a wood grain, right? All right, and we can scroll through these. Right, I have a lot of these. I've accumulated these over time. So while you can't get something that absolutely is curved, you can certainly get close to very, to getting emulating that curve. 
Does Hatchet 255 make more space than using a wipeout example, deleting portions of a TIFF file in AutoCAD? No, it really doesn't. A Hatchet 255, because it's a built-in AutoCAD portion and we're not relying on anything else, it can actually help. And it's not gonna make the drawing any bigger than just a standard hatch. And let's see, for December, converting P styles and removing embedded plot styles buried in blocks exported from Revit. Oh, I have a blog on that, Bob. Well, you know, find out that I have a lot of these things because uh, I know how to get rid of those styles. Uh, actually, I think I just published that one as well. Let's see. And I might have to find that one for you. But I did actually create a blog, Bob, specifically on how we have to go through and, and get rid of those styles that show up, style one, style two, style three. For now in December, when working with raster design, many of my organizations are embedding raster images into AutoCAD files. And the, this saves us from having to maintain an external reference, but the problem with raster image, because it's an Olay, any issues that you've seen with plotting embedded raster images. Um, Mark, it, it, it's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, when you embed an, when you embed a raster image as an Olay, you're creating a link basically to a static image. Um, you can't edit those. They're great for portability. The problem is, is now you're creating, um, a file that's larger because now it has to embed some of that in there. Um, the more of those type of objects you embed in your drawing, the slower the performance becomes. One of the other things I see with images that are embedded like that, when you move from one version to another version or you move up a couple of versions, so let's say you embedded them on 2020 and you open up those drawings in 23, what I tend to see often, and it's not all the time, but what I tend to see often is that that Olay image will be modified or warped. So it will be stretched in one direction and not in the other. And then that becomes a problem where you actually have to remove the Olay image and reinsert it in order to have it work correctly. Are there any PAT files available that can be imported from a trusted Autodesk site? That's a good question, Jacob. Um, depending on what it is you're looking for. If you are looking for stone facades, for example, there's a lot of companies out there that do their own, that produce stone. And because they produce stone, they actually have their own, they basically have their own hatch pattern files that you can look at. And if you give me just one second, I might actually have one of those off the top of my head. And let's see, which one is it? Coronado Stone is a good one. Um, Jacob, if you go to Coronado Stone, I think it's coronadostone.com, they actually, if you're looking for stone patterns, they actually have all of their hatch patterns available on their site. Typically, if you're looking for something specific, um, generally I recommend going to the maker and see if they have a hatch pattern. So a lot of a lot of those companies like Coronado Stone and some of the others do have theirs. Um, as far as imported from a trusted Autodesk site, I don't know that Autodesk even has a trusted list. Really, it's gonna be a lot of hit and miss or creating your own, um, depending on what you actually need. And if you have something specific in mind, um, you can always reach out to us. We can always do it as design assistants. And generally speaking, I'll, I will be the one that's building hatch patterns. So I can actually help you with that. Yes, and I, I typically tend to avoid Olays. And when I copy a hatch pattern into a drawing from a previous drawing, why won't AutoCAD let me use that hatch again? It's in the list, but it's just grayed out. Um, if you're copying it from one drawing into a new drawing, it's going to be grayed out because you may not have the source file, the source pat file. So you need to actually have the source pat file in order to be able to reuse it rather than just copying it or matching or doing match props. Uh, let's see. 
Wow, we we are right up up against. We are coming right up against. Ten o'clock, Lori, and I'm. I need to finish up my last little bits here. So yes. Yeah. Those are a couple of things here. We've done our Q and A. Um, so just FYI, we've got some new AutoCAD 2023 classes coming available for fall. If you're curious to want to look at them, go to imagineit.com forward slash training. We can certainly get you in something here if you're curious or want to learn more about AutoCAD specifically. Um, let's see, I've got one more question. We currently use Wipeout on our panel components to block out the DIN rail behind the vice. Is there a better option to use? Yes. Absolutely, Paul. I would use a hatchet color 255 and make sure that when you go to your plot screen, um, let me just go here. When I go to plot and I have a, oh, it's not in here. Here's my AutoCAD right here. Come all the way down to 255 and you set your screening to zero or one here and it will always plot as a blank hatch. That's my preferred. Um, wipeouts can tend to cause problems. I have used Hatch for years because this is the way I like to use if you're using color-based. If you're using style-based, that's going to be, a, if style-based plotting or STB plotting, that's gonna be a different animal altogether. And that's something we would have to talk about. And, right, I'm trying to get this wrapped up and huh. My next one, AutoCAD Tips and Tricks, December 15th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we're gonna recap basically everything that I've done this year and we'll do some live Q&A and I will probably have one or two gems in there. Um, uh, that, again, I, I'll anytime that you guys have other things that you want covered, let Lori know. She's really good about forwarding, Elliot at rand.com. Um, send her things and topics and let her know awesome and let's let's see hatches currently in your drawing example are they available for download um i don't have them available for download um a lot of those that i've just built on my own or i've accumulated over time um something we can certainly talk about david because i believe you are a client of ours um hatch patterns in revit um hatch revit doesn't use the same type of engine um, as AutoCAD does, but I believe you can import AutoCAD hatch patterns into Revit. So build them in AutoCAD, bring them across, tried exporting and plotting with different PC3s and Arabic never exports correctly what to do. Um, Aaron, that may be a scenario where you have to, and that's something that we would probably need to investigate a little deeper as a support case, but you may just have to force all of your fonts to basic AutoCAD geometry, and that may get them to print correctly. Did you ever put your paver hatch into the example or uh, DM questions? So you're talking about my paver hatch that I have right here, right? If that's the one you're talking about, um, the code's right here. It's gonna be in my presentation and it's gonna be in this drawing. You just copy and paste this into Notepad and you're set. And you can have this custom paver. And in my PowerPoint, you have these. These just copy and paste and they'll work. And if there are others that you need or want, um, you know, you can always let us know. We can always do these as specials for you. Over and over again after all these years. So thank you very much for your time. And thanks everyone for joining us.